one paper cover three communities that have five school districts, multiple city councils, mm. library yes. boards, commissions, yes. and committees between them, and still have time to cover the community Amazing. stories? Like one involving the FBI, mm -hmm. a straw hat, and a flower <laughs> print shirt? Welcome to the Backstory Project, where the story behind the question is told, and we as listeners get a window into the people who affect the life of our communities. My name is Annie Slavinsky, and I've been working with Open Doors since 2001 as actor, director, and teacher. And my name is McKinley Johnson, and uh, I've been with Open Doors since 2006 as a playwright and director. Today's interview is with Bob Uphughes, editor of the Riverside Brookville Landmark. I'd adventure to guess that there are very few people who know the stories of those communities as well as he does. And we are so excited that he is sharing them with us. Well, I'm particularly interested to hear how the hat, the shirt, <laughs> and the FBI end up in a story. <laughs> If you enjoy this interview, we ask you to consider making a donation to Open Door. Your support will help the company continue its storytelling on stage and with these videos. Just visit our website at opendoortheater.net and click on the donate button. That's right. Thank you so much for your support. And now, here's Bob Uphughes. Hi, I'm Bob Uphughes. I am the editor of the Riverside Brookfield Landmark newspaper, which covers Riverside, Brookfield, and North Riverside. Um, how did I end up a journalist? It was not a direct line of, of any sort. Um, I, I was on an academic track. I was uh, in grad school I was studying art history. Um, and uh, I was recently married with a one-year-old or, or newborn, uh, just uh, born. My wife, uh, who is a pharmacist, um, uh, you know, we wanted to move back to Chicago, which is my hometown. Um, and uh, so she was able to find a job pretty quickly um, as a pharmacist. Um, and I had no idea what I was going to do, but I knew how to write. I liked sports, so I figured, well, see if I can figure out a way to combine those two things. And the only thing I could really think of was being a sports writer for a newspaper. And so I sent out um, as writing samples um, to newspapers, um, you know, chapters of my master's thesis and uh, term papers that I had written because I had never written a news story in my life. Uh, but uh, I was, uh, um, there were uh, two places that had mercy on my soul. Uh, one was the Daily Herald, uh, a, a great edit, sports editor named Bob Frisk, who sent me a, a wonderful little note saying, here's somebody you can call, um, you know, let him know that, you know, I, I, I sent you his way. And so I started doing freelance sports writing for the Daily Herald. And then I got a call from Wednesday Journal, which when I was just sending out, you know, resumes to newspapers, I had never heard of Wednesday Journal. I thought it sounded like a ridiculous name for a newspaper. I was actually had a second thought about actually sending this organization my resume, not exactly knowing what the heck it was. But I did, and I got a call back from the features editor, who they were always looking for um, freelance writers to write features, and uh, that's how I started writing for uh, Wednesday Journal. Quite a while. I, I, I started out as, the, uh, as a freelancer, and I did that probably for almost a year. And then toward the end of that first year, um, Dan Haley, the publisher, created essentially the position of sports editor Wednesday. Um, and I was, uh, I was hired as the first sports editor. Um, and at the same time, I was also hired as the real estate editor, um, and I was told it was a part-time job. So <laughs> I spent six days a week at my part-time job, uh, and uh, um, uh, and you know I learned how to be a reporter, you know, by doing the job essentially. I mean, I, I you know I learned how to write news stories 
along the way. Um, and uh, I mean, I didn't even really type until I was hired to, uh, to work here full time. I had written stories out longhand and then retyped them. Um, and when I, my first week as the sports editor, faced with the number of stories I had to write, um, I realized I couldn't do it that way. So I just had to force myself to learn how to just blast away on a keyboard. And so that's, I, so it was not the traditional go to journalism school and learn how to be a reporter. It was learn how to be a reporter as you're doing it. Um, and then um, it wasn't until, um, you know, 12 years later that I started working at the uh, Riverside Brookfield Landmark as the editor. I, and I thought I'd do that for a couple of years. And uh, 18 years later, here I still am. And what, what the communities that still retain the newspapers understand is that they have a source of news of their own community, you know, a reflection of what's going on in their own town that these other towns don't have. I mean, there are, there are, there are towns where the residents really have no idea what their government is doing, um, how their schools are necessarily being governed or, or, or how policies are being decided. But if we weren't covering Riverside and North Riverside and Brookfield, there wouldn't be anybody covering them. And, you know, those, they're, they're vibrant towns. They're all different towns. They're, total, they're right next to each other and they're all totally different. Um, and they're interesting communities with interesting people with great stories to tell. And we're able to tell them. And uh, if we're not there, there's no one else there to tell them. And, and it's, so our, I, I, I view our role as just indispensable for, uh, for communities. Covering three towns, even three small towns, um, is a lot of work because even though it's, it's a small town, every town has a government, every government has meetings, you got to go to, you know, cover them. Um, uh, I, I, I'm either fortunate or unfortunate that they, all these governments now meet on different days. Sometimes they used to meet on the same and I couldn't go to all of them. Uh, but now they all meet on different days so I, I can make every single one of them. Um, and uh, so I, I cover a lot of aspects of every town from local government to, you know, police and fire, business, um, uh, real estate, uh, and so on. I am incredibly fortunate in that I have a long-term regular freelance journalist named Bob Skolnick who provides the lion's share of coverage of school districts for the landmark. I mean, it, his contribution is invaluable, especially when you consider the strange setup of school districts in the three towns that I cover. Um, there are five elementary school districts and two high school districts spread among the three towns because of the way the areas, you know, um, developed. When it comes to determining coverage, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that play into it. Um, certainly there's, there's a certain sort of public service aspect to community journalism where we write about government, you know, operations um, that I think are really essential for people to know about, for us to document, for the record to be, you know, made uh, about those kinds of decisions and, and, and how the, you know, how, how government plays out in those places. However, there are, there are also stories about people in, in these towns. And I think, I think a lot of um, uh, readers come to read about their neighbors, to read about people. Maybe they don't know who these people are who are living in their towns, who they might be interested to, uh, to learn about. Um, who uh, you know are doing interesting things, or you know wonderfully generous things, or maybe something that they could get involved in. I, I think I think readers are really in, interested in those stories, and we try to tell those as, as much as we can. And we depend on our readers to let us know who these people are, uh, and they and thank God they do. Uh, but people who just call us or email us and tell us about an interesting person or an interesting thing that's happening on their block. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you know, people would have, 
you know, there'd be a family that'd be having a concert in their driveway every Thursday night. Or, you know, there was this uh, man in, in Riverside uh, who periodically would take his baritone saxophone out and do little parades in, in neighborhoods, playing his saxophone and, and uh, you know, uh, entertaining, you know, people as they wave to him on their front porches. You know, we find out about those things by people telling us about them. And, you know, um, and so if people are talking about those sorts of things on social media or they're reaching out to us because they think it's interesting, those are good stories to tell and we want to tell them. There, there are also, um, people are immensely interested in new restaurants that open or new bars that open. You, some of the most trafficked um, stories on our website um, have to do with, you know, little restaurants that are opening or, a, you know, a new food related business. People, people adore those kinds of stories and so you know we're we have our antenna up for those kinds of stories you know any any time that you know government is going to be coming they're, they're going to come and approach you know taxpayers with you know they want to resurface the streets or they would like to build a new police station or a new library for that matter um, and they want to go to voters and and ask them for the money to do that or build a new school, um, you know, that's, you know, that, that's incumbent upon us to be, um, you know, at the forefront of letting people know that that's, that's wow. kind of, the Brookfield Library Board was initially um, planning to build a new library. Um, they went to referendum and they, there were many, you know, there were a lot of public um, workshops and uh, outreach um, and there was a lot of, you know, discussion you know, in whether it was comments on our, on our websites to stories or on social media where our stories were shared and then discussions played out, you know, in other places with our story as kind of the basis for it. You know, those are pretty um, uh, robust discussions that, that end up taking place. Um, and, um, and in the case of the Brookfield Library, they were defeated uh, they, and they did not get their referendum. Um, and it forced them to find an alternative way to raise the money to build this library um, that did not involve a referendum and uh, um, a, you know a, a, a line item on individual tax bills you know over 20 years that you know would pay it off. You know they started a foundation. They raised you know money that way. They got a one million dollar gift from one particular donor. You know, they started saving money, um, and they were, you know, able over a period of five or six years to, you know, raise enough money and then get a loan from uh, a bank uh, to uh, to fund it. So they were able to finally, you know, find an alternative funding source for that. And you know, those discussions, you know, are were all part of our our coverage. You know, over a period of, you know, they they. They conceived of this new library idea in 2007. It's getting built this year. So these things play out over a long period of time. And, you know, I mean, we were the ones reporting on that. I mean, they, no one else was reporting on that. Um, I've had some very bizarre stories that I've covered throughout the years. Um, one of the, the strangest um, was um, a the, uh, a Riverside resident, in fact, he died last week. Um, he was a, uh, he's a prominent property owner in Brookfield. Um, he was one of my most trusted sources of information. And um, he was targeted for a kidnapping, extortion, murder plot by an ex-Chicago police officer who conspired with another man to basically try to extort all of his money and get him to sign over all of his property to these two, and then they were going to kill him and get rid of the body. And he didn't know that this was going on, obviously, until he got a call from the FBI one day who said, uh, basically, um, there's something going on that you're in a little bit of danger, and we need to borrow one of your cars. We need to borrow one. He always wore Hawaiian shirts and a straw hat. We need to borrow one of your cars, one of your Hawaiian shirts and a straw hat, and we'll call you 
when we're done. And so he, he did this and he gets a call two days later. They've arrested these two guys who they, you know, the FBI used his car, put an FBI agent in his clothes, drove the car to where they were going to snatch him because it was all planned out. And when these two guys rolled up behind him, the FBI, you know, mobbed them and, and took them into custody. Um, and uh, that was the subject of a, a trial that played out in federal court. Uh, the, 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 the guy who was the mastermind of this thing had been convicted of murder previously and was on death row actually, but then got his conviction thrown out. And then he was arrested and sentenced again to like life in prison for a kidnapping plot in Missouri, was somehow able to get that conviction thrown out. And then this was kind of the next thing. Um, th that guy was convicted. Uh, he was sentenced to life in prison and he's in one of the most secure prisons in the United States right now. I mean, he's, this guy is, is in prison with like 911 terrorist, you know, suspects. Um, so uh, it's, it, that story stands out because it was the craziest story I had ever, you know, even contemplated having to cover in a, in a place like Riverside. You know? you know, when I first started working as a reporter, I, I thought, you know, the worst thing that I would ever have to do would be to call someone whose loved one had just died and I would have to talk to them um, about that person's life um, and, you know, basically get them at a really difficult time in their life. And, and I felt like I was, you know, being incredibly intrusive. And what I discovered was that actually, almost always, those calls were received with gratitude and with nothing but, you know, a, a willingness to want to share, you know, more about who that person was. Those conversations are, are you know, helpful, um, you know, for the person telling the story. You know, I think they, they help um, uh, people who might not know that person very well understand them more. Um, and uh, those, so like th that kind of writing, writing obituaries and, and writing those kinds of stories uh, became something that I actually, um, uh, you know, I, I, I like doing. I, I think they're great stories to tell and I think people need to be told those stories and, and, and I learned that not to be afraid of those calls. Um, I think of local news uh, as, as being indispensable moving forward. People are always going to want to know what is happening in their towns. Um, I think the old model for funding local news, which was typically, you know, advertisers in the community, you know, retailers and uh, banks and hospitals, you know, would uh, want to advertise on a regular basis. Uh, you know, that's what formed the core of, of the revenue for the newspapers. That, that is over. That's not happening anymore. I mean, there is some advertising, but it's not enough to sustain a news operation. So the future of local news is figuring out how to actually get it to be funded. Um, you know, here at Growing Community Media, about a year and a half ago or so, you know, we determined that really the only sustainable way forward was to move to this nonprofit model and, and thank God we did um, when the pandemic hit, because when the pandemic hit, our, our print advertisers disappeared. I mean, um, and, you know, we were able to respond by going directly to our readers and say, hey, look, if you want local news, if you want to know how this pandemic essentially, you know, we're going to weather this thing, you know, we need you to, to participate. And so, you know, and, and, and the response has been great. People, and, that, and that's why, you know, for me, the, 
there's always going to be a need and, and a want for local news. There's a, there's an appetite for it, and there's and there's also a willingness by readers to pay for it because they understand its importance and they understand that you know it takes money to uh, uh, to produce. And last so. summer, you know, when uh, on you know, May 31st, when sort of everything that had happened related to the George Floyd um, uh, demonstrations elsewhere you know, really sort of coalesced in Chicago and, and you know, ended up on my doorstep, um, literally, um, in terms of where I actually live, my house is, um, which is not far from where I cover. Um, and so that afternoon, um, uh, I, I, I walked over to the North Riverside Mall and I was walking through the parking lot, you know, as the cars are flying by me and people are running in and out of the mall and the police are you know in riot gear are, are running up toward the uh, um, the mall and I'm standing near one of the entrances um, and you know taking all of this in and then you know there's eight or nine gunshots off to my right um, uh, you know at that point I'm thinking okay I, I might not be in the safest spot that I'm, I'm standing in right now um, but, you know, again, I mean, it was, th this was happening and I, it, it was important for me to be there physically and not, you know, making phone calls and asking people what's going on. I, I needed to be there myself to see what was happening. Um, and that was, you know, that was, it wasn't crazy. I mean, that, that was something I felt the need to be there to do and document. Um, it was an you know, it was a, you know, a, a remarkable day, a remarkable, you know, couple of weeks, actually, it turned out to be. Um, and then, you know, in, in the wake of that day, there were many more days of peaceful demonstrations, you know, ones that, you know, touched the periphery of, of the towns I covered, and then ones that really sort of were homegrown you know, demonstrations organized by uh, invariably younger people, um, you know, who were marching, you know, through the streets of Riverside, who would have ever imagined, you know, um, and North Riverside and Brookfield. Um, and those were, um, those were kind of part of that whole um, arc of, of narrative last summer that, you know, I, I was part of in terms of being there and witnessing it and documenting it and, and talking to the, some of the people, you know, involved in, in that and, and sort of um, telling, you know, a kind of part of a national story that was one of, you know, a, a sort of a transformation of the way people, you know, were thinking. Um, and uh, um, that, was, that, was a, that was a remarkable story. Yeah. The only, this job isn't for everybody. I mean, it's you know, it's it, it's 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 a job that you know I've been doing it so long. It, it's part of the the landscape. But what you realize when you're a journalist is that you know it's it's kind of a public job. It's almost like being a public official, and people are looking at you and trying to determine who you are and what you're. You know, people are probably trying to decide you know where I'm coming from. And you know how I uh, approach, you know, reporting the news, and uh, you know, am I trustworthy? Am I reliable? Like, you know, you gotta, you gotta be pretty certain about what you're doing, and um, and uh, confident about you know how you're presenting things, um, and that's not for everybody. I mean, there it's 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 pressure, and the hours are terrible, and the pay is bad, and you know, so it's got everything going for it. Um, it, uh, um, but, uh, um, uh, but, you know, when I, you know, when I'm, when I'm done with the day, you know, I think what I have done contributed to the community. So I can live with that. Oh, my curiosity is satisfied. What an incredible story. Who knew an undercover operation right here in Riverside? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and what's also clear is how much he loves and respects the communities his papers serve. Absolutely. It's wonderful, wonderful. Our next episode returns us to the places where we love to eat. Connie's Restaurant Ooh, in yes. Berwyn. 
Andy Soderopoulos, the general manager and third generation from his family to manage the restaurant, will be our guest. The interview will be posted on November 9th. And now, if you're not on Open Door's constant contact list, just email us at opendoor902 at gmail.com and ask to be included. The link will be emailed on November 9th. And it will also be available on our website the same day. Just click on the Backstory Project for Andy Soderopoulos' story. Before we leave, thank you again to Bob Uphughes at Riverside Brookfield Landmark for sharing his story, and thank you for listening. So, again, if these stories matter to you, please consider donating to Open Door. Our website is Open Door Theater, and click on that donate, donate button. Your support in any amount is greatly appreciated.